May God fill you all with great hope and joy and peace in your believing. Amen. The message today for this, the 12th Sunday after Pentecost, is from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 15, the wonderful account of what defiles a person and when a defiled person comes to Jesus Christ. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Overeating was encouraged in my house growing up almost like a rule. Todd, you don't finish those potatoes, you don't get that cherry pie, said Mom, many, many times. And of course, I wanted that cherry pie. (laughs) Dad's rule was always having hands washed before coming to the table. And then I remember my own pastor would sometimes joke at some of our dinners and say, that's the one good thing about our Lutheran faith, we can eat and do almost everything in moderation. (laughs) But overeating and washing hands is what Jesus is saying isn't very important, right? Well, yes and no. Washing hands doesn't prove that inside there's a clean soul any more than overeating proves that it's good food. It's not what goes into the body that's the problem. It's the heart, the attitude, the human nature, the seat of who we are. That's what Jesus touches upon when he mentions the heart. That's where the thoughts and the ideals and the emotion in the Hebrew understanding whirl around, and that is the problem place. In their sense, if the heart isn't right with God, the mind will not be right either. So it's not the fault of the cherry pies, or at one time sitting down and eating 35 buffalo chicken wings in one sitting, and that's true, or that tasty apple fritter Tim Hortons, that's not the donut's fault that I carry a little bit around the middle here. Food consumption and hand washing are constant concerns, though, even in our culture still. Some of that's good, some of that, well, maybe isn't. But in the religious leader's eyes, these topics sealed your fate for heaven or for hell. God ordained such common sense health procedures, not only for preparation for worship, but really to keep the children of Israel alive and free from sickness and bacteria. There was a health concern in the Old Testament as well. But the washing and the eating had never been meant to keep anybody away from God, nor a standard to somehow measure your faith. Now, in our English Bibles, the Pharisees accuse uh, Jesus and his disciples of the defiled hands. And the defiled, really, when Matthew wrote the gospel, the Greek word he used actually just means ordinary, like plain hands. They could have been dirty, maybe not that dirty. So they weren't really correct in their assumption. But they may have been rinsed, they may have been wiped. It would almost be like, well, do we choose to wear jeans today or press suit pants? One isn't better than the other, they're just different. But these unimportant matters, they were never meant to be a standard. What benefit is there holding these kind of rules anyway? No one should be so afraid of offending God that we would ever keep anyone away from his presence or make people worry they're hell-bound for matters that don't even pertain to faith. God knows the heart. We can't know who's in with God and who's out. The temple pecking order in those days would have worked that way too. The men from the house of Israel with the wealth, the reputation, they held the top spot. And then the young boys 13 and older from those households would have been next. And then the other young boys of Israel. And then married women of those top wealthy men. Then the regular women. Then the single or widowed and young girls. And then what was called the others. Gentiles. Anyone not from the house of Israel. So imagine how low a Canaanite woman would have been on that ladder. The name Canaan, even in the Hebrew, means low, but not in a negative sense, in a humble sense, because they originally settled in low lands, and they lived on the other side of the Jordan River near Palestine, what is Palestine today. And their ethnicity was a mix, Jew, Arab, Syrian, and Greek. Talk about an enemy ethnicity to Israel. But it's easy, hating, loving, and friendship, that's harder, takes time. Love takes sacrifice and commitment. And God is so much more, though, than just good behavior and proper etiquette. 
living differently or not having perfectly washed hands, that's not a failure in God's eyes. Rather, it's the selfish pride that wells up from every sinner's heart to put the self first, to ignore or dislike or treat as non-persons, our neighbors, instead of loving them, accepting them, helping them, or it's worst, our selfishness can give rise to all those ugly things Jesus mentions, which really are all the commandments, the murder, the lusting, the stealing, the speaking unkindly of others. And God sees that's what's deep inside. He has all our DNA at his fingertips, all our history, our culture, what our hearts get attached to. We might fool one another, but we never can fool God. But imperfection in a good way makes us all the same. It levels the playing field, just as grace makes us redeemed and loved all the same. That Canaanite woman is many things, but she's not naive. Everyone knows the children of Israel in that time would focus on that great messianic afterlife, the feast at the Savior's end of the life wedding banquet, the heavenly life we all look forward to. And primarily they believed it was for them and no one else. Now, we heard from Isaiah 56 this morning, and even other parts of Isaiah, and even in the Psalms and other prophets, the children of Israel were aware that others got into heaven too. The Canaanite woman knows she's invited to God's table, otherwise she wouldn't go to such public lengths to get her share. And she speaks correctly. It's formal temple language of worship. Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. Lord, she sees him as the heir of King David. That's great faith right there. And she's persistent in asking for mercy. Like we hear on Palm Sunday, the Hosanna comes from this word grouping of Lord, have mercy on me. And she shouts, she raises her voice and refuses to give in. Now what mother, what parent wouldn't do the same thing? If you know someone who could save your child just by asking, you'd never quiet down. And remember, women in ancient times just didn't do that. And not an outsider, an outcast for sure. No woman at that time would yell out loud or approach a man alone. But mothers never stop advocating for their children. The strong voice for the voiceless babies, every, especially one troubled by a demon. Now just imagine the condemning looks about that situation. What did they do wrong to have a demon attack a nice little girl? Demons then had been just as misunderstood as they still are today, superstitiously and with great fear. And Satan's around. He knows Jesus is making his rounds, and he'll eventually crush his nasty head. But contrast this woman's great need and her great faith. Often we might know in our own life, great faith grows from great need. There are lots of people who know they need something, but they always don't know exactly what it is they need. And that goes for you and me as well. Try this, try that. It's like haphazard cooking, but nothing seems to satisfy. And mostly we tend to focus on what that might be to fill the kind of need we don't know we have. But the truth is that there is an emptiness we all carry, and that is the emptiness Jesus fills, and only he can fill it. Faith focuses on the one who can fill the need. And that Canaanite woman has faith, not just because she's desperate for help, and not only because she trusts Jesus as the last resort to help, but Jesus publicly applauds her great faith. And our faith is great too, because it recognizes our own great need. That's why we're here. And that comes from the Spirit's inner working in our lives. And in this great faith, we stay close to our Savior time and time again. In fact, it comes through life most unconsciously to us. Often when we think we're alone, that's when he's most present. Knowing we have need and trusting in Jesus to change us in the process, that's really repentance. That's humility and that is great faith. So does it make you wonder why Jesus would brush her off like that? Why not welcome her with open arms? She's probably the only one that speaks of faith in that whole huge crowd there. And he tells her he's helping his own people first. Then compares her to a dog. Now, that isn't necessarily a nasty negative term here. Now, dogs in that culture didn't have the elevated status that they do in our culture today. But households did have pet dogs 
who did eat the leftovers from the dinner table. And that's exactly what this woman is asking for, licking up crumbs from God's table. Jesus wants this to be said. He wants this female outsider, a Canaanite woman, to say this in public so his own people can hear it. And he welcomes her the best and most valid way any man would honor a woman in public, which is to commend her and let her words speak and be on display to show her great faith. Jesus loves this unique, courageous woman. Her life shows us all that worthiness and place and status and job have nothing to do with faith. She's not worthy. The people around in that crowd aren't worthy. The disciples aren't worthy. Even you and I are not worthy. None of us deserve to receive the good from God. In fact, despite our wrongs, we are loved all the more anyway. His love and faith make our wrongs right in Christ. And that's the point of not trying to live a selfish lifestyle that Jesus was talking about at the beginning with what goes into the mouth. Life is not just about us and what we need or desire. And great faith doesn't require anything of us because great faith comes from the one who makes us worthy. And that's what's so amazing about Jesus. He refuses to honor the discriminations religious people expect. He refuses to let the outer appearance and the heritage be the pedigree for love and acceptance. Jesus comes from the house of David, and yet he's insulted because that's the one coming from Nazareth, the son of a lowly carpenter, and he eats with sinners and is called a glutton. He doesn't make the disciples follow the rules, and now he has the nerve to say a Canaanite woman with a demon-infested daughter has great faith, and then he heals that child instantly. Nowhere better will Jesus give us great faith. Because this will be gift-wrapped with the flesh and blood of a naked Savior on Calvary's cross. From this, we get to that. And that while suffering and dying, he fully exposes all the wicked, twisted hearts of every person of the world. All the evil is rubbed like wicked salt into Jesus' wounds, his vulnerable, crucified body. And like... A dog's nose gets rubbed in its own mess. All of our human mess of wrongs is wiped clean from Jesus' shed blood. It's all gone. The one who dies, an outcast and a criminal, outside the city gates of his own holy city, brings all nations, all the others, together with us as one family in his body. All people become his people in his precious life-giving death. Everyone baptized into him are baptized into this blood-soaked cross and receive great faith. Great faith keeps us in the one who died and worthy to stand before him. We are worthy to stand in his place as his body in the world. We stand there with the Canaanite woman and her daughter that's healed. With her we eat the crumbs from the master's table when we dine at the communion rail. When we share a meal with family, friends or strangers, we're doing the same. Every time we help somebody who needs help, Every time we show that face of Jesus in a hope-filled manner of daily living. We are a people of peace and faith and hope. And we are inheritors of grace and eternal life. And this gives us the confidence to ask God anything. Even when we don't, we're asking. Because the Christ is in us. Ask Jesus for help every moment of every day. His help is there anyway. Asking in prayer just keeps the conversation going, coming from our mouths, and that shows our hearts are forgiven as we trust with great faith. And nothing we put into our bodies can change that. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.